the yes, big show. Yes, now we're live. Now we're live. Is this, is this the big backup show? It is the big backup show. We're talking all about photography backup and everything you want to know, physical, cloud, all that nonsense. We have this great group of pros and amateurs and everyone in between in here, so we should get all your questions answered. So, Dave, you know this isn't really a show. It's just sort of a – I'm not really a host. We just kind of hang out with smart people and – talk about junk. Isn't that the way it goes? We try. We try. We try. We try. That's all we can best. ask. We have, yeah. we have great people here tonight, but we have a special guest who has just joined us. It was unannounced. I know. Very exciting. Do you know who it is, Dave? I'm not sure. I think I do know. Maybe feel, you'll slowly rise presence. from an uncomfortable position in your abode. I feel a presence. I don't know. Who is going. it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's Scott Jervy. Hey, Scott. Hey, what? everybody. <laughs> what are you doing crawling around in the shag carpeting of Dave Beffer's home there? Can you can you explain your presence on his floor? Uh, you know, I he needed help with photography things, and I came here because, you know, he doesn't know too much about computers, so I was like, I'll come fix your computers for you, and... Do some tech stuff, you know. Ah, so you're like the cable guy that just stays over for the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, Scott texted me on a Friday, like, "Hey, I'm gonna be in Jersey tomorrow." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was working. I was working on some stuff on Friday, and I was like, "Oh, I go to New York later today on a red eye. I should figure out what I'm doing when I get there." And there I was like, "Hey." Dave's in New Jersey, and I had a wedding here in yeah. northern New Jersey. Well, actually, I didn't know where Dave lived. I just knew it was in New Jersey. Found out it was, like, super close. I said, hey, let's hang out. Well, excellent. And uh, you happen to be one of the world's foremost experts in backup solutions, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> the four, maybe five most. Not, I don't All know right, about the yeah. foremost. All right, I rounded to the I nearest. I think we have three of the other four. Yeah. We do. Let's see. Let's see who we have here. We'll go. Let's start with another guy that happens to be in New Jersey. I don't know why all roads lead to New Jersey, but John Postazidis. Hey, John. What's up, people? What Hanging are you up to? Hey, folks. tell people who you are and what you do and that sort of thing. Well, you know, everybody just calls me John P. for obvious reasons. I do a little show with someone you may have heard of, Callie Lewis, called Geek Beat. And uh, we just have fun, travel around, play with lots of toys. I have a whole room full of toys here with me, not the least of which is this Show us new a toy. Here's a, here's a new gadget. That's called All the right. 360 Hero. It is a, uh, it's got six uh, Hero 3 GoPro units strapped together, and it lets us shoot... 360-degree panoramic videos, kind of like the 360-degree photos you've seen, only while the video is in motion, you can look around. It's pretty cool. I was going to ask if Google hired you to become like a human street view camera. Yeah, that's what that's been our joke, you know, because uh, we, we walk around with this thing on the head and uh, it looks pretty dorky, but gets the job done. Oh, so, no, I don't think it looks dorky. I think that looks, you know... Oh, that's probably one of the worst looking things you've ever put on your head, John. Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, who else do we have here? Uh, Scott Cublin. Yes. Hey, everybody. I'm Scott Cublin, but I wouldn't consider myself an expert with backup. In fact, I'm probably going to be embarrassed tonight when I talk about my backup solutions, especially after hearing others, such as what John P. does, because I know his is all high tech and and mine's very, very low tech. So, uh, I'm not going to say I'm an expert. I'm just the average Joe tonight. No, I think John P is sort of the exception because actually he's got bigger problems than any of us photographers because he does so much video and high def video. So, he's got at least another order of magnitude of problems. So, I think like his input will be super valuable. I can't wait to, he's always even more on the cutting edge than me. So, I can't wait to see what he has to say. Yeah, my stuff will suck compared to his. Thanks for building me up. You guys are putting all the pressure on me now. Yeah, well, yep. after that hat, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Eric Chang, give us 
Give us the what for. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Eric Chang. I am an underwater photographer and uh, director of photography at Lytro. Uh, I also run a website called Wet Pixel, which is for underwater photographers. And um, I am the guy who harps on all of my friends to back their stuff up. <laughs> so I was really interested in being on the show because I've tried many different backup solutions. Um, and I have a software background, so I'm interested in in why this stuff doesn't work yet. <laughs> so looking forward to the, to the uh, oh, chat. Good. You're perfect. You're perfect for the show. Also, by the way, I'm going to grab my webcam there and take it behind my computer when we start the discussion and show you my setup as well. And I don't think I have the optimal setup. I've got a good one. But I think it's one of these things that just keep evolving and changing over time. OK, uh, Peter Adams, you're next. Hey everybody, I'm Pete Adams. I'm a commercial and editorial photographer based in Silicon Valley. Um, been doing sort of startup ventures for a long time and now turning a lot of time and attention to photographing them, uh, all the stuff going on here in the Valley. So I've been, I've been through five or six different major backup schemes, you know, sort of over the years. Um, I've finally settled on something that kind of works. Um, so excited to share that with you guys. And look what is on my screen here, uh, Pete <laughs> Adams. Uh, tell us, tell us what this is. I've also uh, written a book, which you can get on Flat Books, which is called Word for Photographers, um, and sort of a way uh, to help photographers learn about how to set up great-looking websites uh, using WordPress. So, if you want to maintain lots of style and control and build a professional website for your photography, go to Flat Books download the book, um, and it's a step-by-step -step guide to help you get going. There you go, and it's, uh, it's right there on the front page. Um, we recently relaunched the new version of Flat Books with an all-new uh, shopping cart and this sort of thing, so like if you ever lose your download, you can come get it again and all that good modern stuff. And So there it is right there, under $10, and you'll get to know everything you need to know about WordPress for photographers. Peter really knows what he's talking about, so I... Um, I super recommend it. Okay, I will unscreen share. So uh, before we get started, we had two things that came up in the pre-show that uh, I want to talk about. Uh, one is um, I'm very interested in this new Android camera that's coming out, Dave, this S4. So it's not going to be sold here in New Zealand, which is sad. Yeah. But you say that I can get one in the States and just have it mailed over here and it's unlocked and everything? Yeah, I don't see why not. Should work just fine. And what's currently I have the Galaxy Nexus. Uh, what's better? Well, first tell everyone about this S4. By the way, people that don't know, I only keep a little bit of track of all these new Android phones and stuff. Dave is like the ultimate Android fanboy. He knows everything all the time. So I just ask him. I outsource it. Instead of outsourcing it to India, I outsource it to, to Dave. Dave, tell us why this phone is so great. Um, well, the S4 is good, especially this Google edition that you're going to get because it's like it's a Nexus experience, but it's not an official Nexus phone. But Google will supply the OS updates. You'll get them faster than having to wait for Samsung. You won't have to use their whatever their interface is called. I don't remember. Samsung. Is it Blur? No, that's Motorola. TouchWiz. So there's, there's isn't, that, two, isn't that a great name? Yeah, so there's, there's two, two S4s, right? There's like the Galaxy, Samsung Galaxy S4, which has their confusing operating system, which yeah. doesn't update as quickly. And then there's the pure Google one. And the pure yes. Google one is really what you want, right? Yeah, it's pure Google. Yeah. It's carrier unlocked. You're buying it directly from Google. So basically they're going to ship you a GSM unlocked international phone. You can maybe pop your SIM card in there, activate, and be on your way. No bloat. Everything's going to run nicely. You're going to be able to tether if you want because it won't be shut off by the carrier. And how much better is the camera than the one I currently have? Um, a pretty good amount. I don't have specific details of how good of a camera it is, but it's when you're talking about Android phone cameras, it's probably pretty much the best one available. I think... So a lot of people like the HTC One, but it does some sort of super pixel technology, and it, but it's only a four megapixel sensor in the end. Ah, okay. So even though it does take better low light, I think overall the camera is still better on the S4, and it's much bigger files. 
And is there a website that you order this from? Can I just um, just jump on Google. there at a certain time? Will it sell out or what's? The I don't know if it's going to sell out because it's a lot more expensive than the Nexus Four when that came out. Um, but it'll come out in two days on the Google Play Store in the U.S. Like so, you'll have to have somebody in the U.S. order it for you. Yeah. And so and that's how you order it through the Google Play Store. You don't go to like Best Buy or whatever um, Amazon. No, prob you probably not. Play. They 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 did have the Nexus Four at some stores and whatnot, but not not right away. Not in the beginning. All right. So day one, it's going to be if if it was anything like the Nexus Four launch, it's going to be a nightmare to try and order. That was yeah. That was a bad launch. Hopefully they've ironed out those kinks. Maybe they ironed them out. Maybe. And it's since it's three hundred more dollars, there'll be a lot less people trying to get it. Yeah. Hey, is there not a GSM unlocked uh, version of the Galaxy camera? I mean if you're if you're interested in Android based camera technology, the phones are fine, but uh, this little bad boy is a dramatically different experience because it has a bigger sensor and it has a big proper lens on it. But I, I don't know if I, I know you can get them for um, for AT and T and for uh, Verizon. But I don't know. Can you just take the AT and T SIM card out and stick it in anything? I, I don't know. I'm Maybe not sure. No. I haven't really looked into that one too much. We've been using this thing all over the world, so it's it's a full-on Android OS. I don't know if you can really see that there. Uh, and what's cool about it is it it takes what I would consider to be pretty good pictures, especially for a pocketable camera, but it also does video. So uh, what we enjoy is walking around, shooting a quick video, and uploading it straight to YouTube, uh, you know, on the 4G network, you you pull up the YouTube interface, you title it, you put the text, the whole the whole nine yards, you know. But you got can you the make big... calls, huh? Can you make phone calls on that? It is not a phone. Oh, but... okay. So that's that's the main differentiator then, right? So yeah, you can't make yeah. calls. You'd have to carry this with your phone. Right. But I mean, you can you can, you can use you it. can get an unlocked GSM version of that camera though. Well, that's you know I, I so I've got the Galaxy Note two, which has almost the same camera as the new S four, hmm. um, and there is a pretty radical difference between these two devices. So I would just offer up that if what you're looking for is an Android based uh, camera, you could either you know, get the Galaxy camera, or the brand new version of this thing was just announced. I think they call it the Galaxy the NX. Yeah, camera NX with interchangeable lenses. Which, honestly, I wouldn't do that because this has a very versatile lens with a good zoom system, and all of these cameras are just going to be adequate from a professional person's opinion. But. Um, you you get get dramatically better performance out of these than you do a phone, no matter yeah. what. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm interested in those, but I think I just need a new phone. My current one is feels slow and sluggish, and I want something faster. And I do carry on a separate camera, so I don't. I would call that sort of a, a betweener. And uh, I love my Note too as well. Yeah, that's good. Uh, hey, by the way, before we jump on to subject number two. Uh, if you want to join in the chat room, just jump into stuckincustoms.com. This was all brought to us courtesy of John P. right there. Um, you can jump in and uh, ask us any questions or you know, do whatever. Uh, Dave is watching that, so come in there. So the other thing that came up during the pre-show was uh, it turns out there's a Venn diagram overlap here of uh, Scott Jarvie and Eric Chang both being interested in this uh, like quadcopter, helicopter-based photography thing. So. I told him to stop the conversation and engage now with that conversation because it sounded interesting to me. Go. Oh, yeah, I was Go. like, hey, Eric. <laughs> he created a group on Facebook that we uh, about quadcopters, and I'm always following the conversation that's going on over there. And I was like, wait, Eric Ching, the Lytro guy? <laughs> and Barry, yeah. Barry Blanchard, who also 
we I talk a lot about him or with him about quadcopters. He's like, yeah, that Eric Chang. And I was like, oh, I've been in his group for a while, seeing him post constantly. So here, it's interesting to see him talk about all this underwater stuff because apparently he likes everything but Earth. He likes going <laughs> underneath it and way above it, but maybe not on it. Yeah, here's a, a little screen share of the group. It's actually it's a private group right now, and that may change later. Uh, but it's just facebook.com slash group slash quadcopters. Uh, if you are interested, just you know, join and, and we'll approve you. Um, in theory, we should have a mutual friend uh, between us and Scott or Trey or you know someone else on here. Um, but it's it was really born because the groups out there, the existing groups, are can be really intimidating. Uh, Scott, I don't know if you've been on these groups, these groups out there, these RC forums, but people yeah, are experts. There's a lot of forums, and then there's another one for just the um, the Phantom. Yeah, so this started because a whole bunch of people started at the same time. And, you know, we all wanted to figure out how to communicate about this new uh, hobby without annoying everybody around us. You know, because we thought it's like, you know, there are a lot of posts, and how many posts can you see about something you don't care about before you get really annoyed, you know? So, um, yeah, so check it out. It's a, it's a great group. Everybody's really friendly. Um, we're more on the beginner side, but there are a lot of tech-savvy people, so if you have so questions about it. How to so you're saying they to, should check yeah. it out now and ask questions before everyone in this group gets more advanced and then start getting annoyed by their questions. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And well, I mean, I think one of the things that'll be important is for us all to document our beginner, you know, our days as a beginner before we forget what we what we didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I did that in a YouTube. I the week after I started, I I wrote down the 200 things I learned in the first week, and I made a blog post and a video about it, and I put it up online, and it, I didn't really talk too much about it, but it, it's like the most viewed thing on my YouTube. Like, everyone's <laughs> way interested in that. There's like I constant would... comments about it, and like 50, 60,000 people have watched it. It's kind of crazy. I was pretty amazed how technical this stuff is. I was actually flying uh, with Barry yesterday, his uh, octocopter, which is what I've got screen shared here, and the amount of electronics that are loaded on this thing is just nuts. It's got like onboard video, it's got GPS, it's got like a stabilized gimbal, an NEX7. I mean, it's just like, it's incredible what goes into these things. Now. Wow, that's a good photo. You just took that yesterday, Peter? Yeah, this is yesterday's flying. Yeah, I was super bummed. He actually wrote me yesterday and said, hey, come out and fly, and I, I couldn't go. <laughs> um, but I want to share one, one more thing. I, you know, I've been documenting this early stuff, too, on a new site called RotorPixel. And um, you know, I'm screen sharing it now. But it's basically, you know, here's a post on how to do aerial panoramas. Um, there's a whole post on connectors. I mean, there are a billion connectors people use. Um, and this is all of this is basically my journey. There's a Lytro on one, which is not so useful, but you know I I could do it, so I did. <laughs> um, you know, and so yeah, connect. I mean, there's just there are a billion questions beginners have, and um, I just you got to get back to the community, so it's worth it's worth documenting. Are you stuff. using that uh, thing that John has, the GoPro 360? And, and no, I, to the... I saw that. I that's one of the things I really want to do. Uh, I think it'd be awesome just to fly that thing above. Pretty much everything. <laughs> we have to we have to see about getting you one. The challenge that I have is um, so they're talking about me bad. They're talking bad about me in the chat room because I, I've got a little uh, I've got a little quadcopter, the DJI Phantom, and I fixed it by adding a uh, gimbal to it. And the problem is the one that I bought. Uh, it fried. It fried the unit. So we sent it to DJI and they fixed it and got it back to me. I just got it back. Um, I I have not yet tried to mount this thing on it. I'm I'm not sure it can carry that payload. I mean, I think it can, but you really kind of need a bigger one. But I saw. I, I don't know whose giant quadcopter that was, or that was a hexacopter or whatever. I don't know whose that was. That would definitely carry it. But you just need something that can hold. I'm guessing a couple of pounds. Yeah, that's Barry's. He's got um he's got the gimbal and an NEX7 mounted on it. Oh um, yeah, that would that would easily carry this thing, and it would be badass to get the 360 video off of it. So we need to see how to make that happen. I want to see someone in our audience uh, Photoshop 
John P's head with that thing on top onto a quadcopter. That would be That'd awesome. Be yeah. It'd be like uh, in that remake of the Wild Wild West, you know, where they put that guy's head on the big machine that had the arm, the, the spider kind of machine. Yeah. In fact, I vote for you to be the first head in a jar, like Futurama, so we can <laughs> save you forever into the future. Nice. Is this the last year of Futurama? It is? Yeah. Oh. This is still they the best quadcopter out there. <laughs> you guys I remember that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good cat internet humor. Oh, he keeps dropping. I, I think, think he's got that same bug problem. you had, yeah. Yeah, I had that bug. I got rid of it. Okay. You switched browsers or I don't know, it just went away after a while. Oh. Well let's uh let's go to the main topic, which is all backups. So this is a big problem, not just for professionals, but for amateurs or I think even people that wouldn't even call themselves uh, photographers. Everyone seems to take a lot of photos. And it sounds like Eric is always on his friends to back up. I'm always on my friends to back up. And I'm in the middle of a huge, uh, actually, ebook and kind of video project right now all about backup, but it's taking me forever, probably take me forever before that's done. So I thought it'd be fun to have sort of an intermediate show to talk about what, uh, what I've been doing. I want to see what everyone else has been doing. I'll go last. I'll kind of show my setup everything uh, last and talk about my, my workflow. Uh, but I ask all the guests to come and talk about like how they used to do things and how it really didn't work and how they do things now, both physical and on the cloud and problems and this and that. Uh, we don't really have a, uh, an order that we're going to go in, but uh, maybe, John, do you want to start out? Because you're, I think you're probably the most hardcore backup guy um, of all of us. Well, yeah, I'm happy to. I think you know what might be useful, especially for the audience who uh, is kind of uninitiated, is to understand a little bit about the differences between various types of backup, so that as we all talk about how we're doing it, we we can put them in context. So uh, there, I would I would kind of tend to break things down into three different categories. Uh, first of all, we're going to have direct attached storage, which would be, for example, uh, little portable drives like this ruggedized LaC drive that I carry around, uh, or something like some of the Drobo devices. This is the Drobo Mini here. Um, I, these are the two devices that I carry when I'm on the road, which you can tell I'm in a hotel room right now. Um, direct attached storage will connect using a uh, cable plugged right into your computer, whether it's Thunderbolt, USB 3.0, Firewire, uh, etc. So um, it attaches and it shows up like it's a drive connected to your system. Then you also have network attached storage, which is completely different. These would be devices like some of the Drobos, for example, a Drobo 5M, uh, all of the Synology devices, the uh, QNAP drives, Pogo plugs, uh, any device that would connect to your network, to your router, with an Ethernet cable. And what that does is it makes the storage available on your network so that it can be shared. Basically, any computer you have can access it through Ethernet. And the main advantage between these two different types of connectivity is um, on the direct attached storage side, for example, if we just look at this little C drive, it uses um, Thunderbolt connectivity. So Thunderbolt would obviously be pretty much the fastest mechanism for transfer that we currently have. So putting putting your data onto it, if you have very large uh, quantities of data, it's going to be fastest to transfer through a Thunderbolt connection or possibly a USB 3.0 if you don't have Thunderbolt. When you have a direct attached drive like the Drobo Mini or some of the other um, Drobos like this, this one uses, I don't know if you guys can see that, it has four different it. hard drives. 
that will make it even faster because the Thunderbolt connect connection can transfer to all of those drives simultaneously. So s speed is the, the key when it comes to direct attached. Network attached storage is going to be limited by the Ethernet connectivity or in some cases, let's say if you're on a, on a computer, a, on a laptop, you may connect with Wi-Fi, so it's going to be much slower. But a network attached drive, like a Synology, for example, can do a lot of other things. It can uh, stream media to any device on your network. Uh, it can run a mail server. It can run all kinds of applications in the network. And the final type of storage would be cloud-based storage. And we see that in services like Dropbox, uh, copy.com, box.net, uh, SkyDrive, Google Drive. And then uh, sometimes you can find a hybrid version where, uh, for example, you might have Dropbox, a Dropbox app that runs on a network attached storage device like Synology or uh, something like that, where parts of your network drive can automatically sync to a cloud for additional backup redundancy. That's the general overview of the types of storage available. Um, we use basically all of it. So with, with because we do GeekBeat, we do a lot of video, we have a tremendous amount of network storage in our office, uh, over 100 terabytes worth, and most of it is connected using iSCSI as an interface because it's the fastest Ethernet connectivity transfer mechanism. Um, and I could go over more of that, but I don't want to bore you guys to tears. I'd rather pass the buck to someone else. Um, and, and if anybody has questions, I can certainly chime in or talk more about how we do certain things, you know? That's good. I know I have questions about Synology. I have, I have a new IOSafe N2 uh, that I've just kind of added to my uh, plethora of drives, and I don't totally understand what's happening there, so I'll ask you about that yeah. soon. Uh, hey, Eric, what do you, you said you talk to your friends all the time about this stuff. If you're sort of just getting into backup, right, if you're a total backup neophyte, which probably means that you have finally got enough data that it's overflowing, your cup is running, running thing over, uh, what do you suggest for people uh, to get started down this path of backup? Well, I always ask them, I ask them how much data they have because a lot of people think they have a lot of data, but in fact, they only have one or two terabytes of data, which fits on a drive. So, you know, and it's also, you can also actually upload that amount of data to cloud-based backup services. Uh, so if you, want, if you have a fast connection or you have a fast connection at work and are allowed to use it, you can actually just back up to the cloud and locally, you know, by having a disk, you know, a direct attached disk um, on, on your machine. So, as John was saying, and so I think, you know, if you have more than what a single drive can safely hold as a backup, things start to get more complicated. And you see people with all sorts of crazy setups. Maybe, maybe someone here has a crazy setup, you know, where they plug in lots of individual drives and just hope it all works. I see that all the time, and I've had two friends have catastrophic failures where they've lost all of their pictures and it is just it is so sad to see that happen I mean that's it's terrible to watch it's it's hard to even talk about it you know as a photographer um, so I usually recommend for people who don't don't have that much data you know I recommend that they check out services like crash plan they're inexpensive they're cloud-based they can back up to local drives and to the cloud and to other people's computers it's super flexible inexpensive, um, you know, and it can be just a single solution. Um, of course, Time Machine, if you're on a Mac, works as well, although I have some things to say about that when I, I get to my own backup strategies. Well, what don't you like about uh, Time Machine? That's interesting. Well, if you have a lot of data, it, it works. I mean, it, it's fast. You know, I've, I've done a lot of testing, and, um, and it, it works until it doesn't work. So one day, you will wake up and it will say, time machine, you know, cannot back up to your backup because it's invalidated. And you have to start over. Mm -hmm. So if you start over, yeah. you need a second drive system to then start over, or you need to nuke your existing one. One's really inconvenient, potentially expensive. The other is terrifying because then you're left in a situation where you have no backup. Um, so that happens to me all the time. You know, I did tests with, you know, maybe five to ten terabytes of data on time machine. It took two days to back up. 
uh, the first time. It worked well. And then like a week later, it said, oh, sorry, you have to start over. So I just stopped using it altogether after, after that. That's Plus, true. Also, I don't you have to, isn't there a hack that you have to have for Time Machine so it doesn't do it every hour and bog down your system? There's oh, a, do you mean back it up? Go ahead. Yeah, there is a Mac app that you can get that will allow you, because it's completely automatic. You don't get to tell it when to do its thing, and it will hog resources. But there's a little freeware app that you can get, and it will tell it to, uh, for example, not check more than once every 6 or 12 hours or something like that. Right. Or you can move it off to, like, another, if you're running, like, a Mac Mini, which is actually kind of what I do, I, I move all the files off to a network server and then let Time Machine crank away on that so it doesn't bog down the laptop. You have the network in the middle, but it's a trade-off depending on how much data you need to be, what your working copy of the data really needs to, how big that is and what you need to be working with. That's interesting. So yeah, with Trey, Time Machine, be, uh, go ahead, John. It might be worth just discussing this this workflow point for just a minute because I, I am also curious about how all of the guys are dealing with data, especially not when you're at home or in a studio, but when you're traveling. Uh, for example, uh, I know that many of us travel extensively. When I'm capturing either photos or videos uh, on the road, if I can trek it in there, I take a Drobo Mini with me. What I do is I shoot, I go back to the hotel room, I immediately empty my, empty my uh, cards onto the Drobo Mini, and then when I get back to the studio in Dallas, we, depending on where it's going, but let's pretend that I've shot footage that someone else is going to process, which happens more often than not, we will transfer it off of the Drobo Mini onto their workstation, uh, which has a RAID array built into it, primarily Mac Pro machines. Uh, they will process it there, and then afterwards they will move it into the network storage for long-term archival. Well, hey, John, when you move stuff off of your um, Drobo Mini to your other computer, do you do a Lightroom um, import type situation, or are you just physically using Finder to move the files? Uh, I may be the I may be unique among this group of of uh, photographers. I don't use Lightroom at all. I use what? Grid. <laughs> Here we I go. Don't use, I don't use it either, John. Okay, good. I'm not alone. Usually I get attacked. I am I leaving the bridge. show. <laughs> I use Bridge, I use Photoshop, and I have yet to have anyone show me a good reason to learn Lightroom and use it. And if anybody okay, wants that's to another that, subject. Yeah. I think there are 500 good reasons people. to use Lightroom. There are a lot of good reasons. I mean, there's other dams like Capture One, which is what I use, but I think they're helpful, especially for moving between. When I talk about my work file, I'll talk about how I use it to move files. Well, this is a good opportunity. Why don't you go ahead and wait? One more question before John, before we talk about your workflow, Peter. So, before you go on the road, on this road trip, you left this step out, but I'm assuming you do it. You basically clear off your Drobo. So it's ready to collect a bunch of data on the road, right? And then you dump it off when you get home, clear it, so you're ready for your next road trip. More or less. So the, the way that my little Drobo works is I've got four of these um, one terabyte drives in it. So when they're th – this is one other important little detail that I would recommend if you get a Drobo Mini. Um, I run this in dual drive redundancy mode, so I could lose two of these drives and the data will still be safe. I do that on every Drobo, every machine, every machine I have that uses hard drives. I have I never ever opt for single drive redundancy. 
and there's a very good reason why. Um, and, and it has nothing to really do with safety. It has everything to do with comfort. I have had uh, hard drives die in m almost every uh, NAS or RAID type device that I have. And if, when you have a single drive redundancy, if, if, that, if one of the four drives, let's say, fails, you're still safe. You can pop it out, throw it away, stick a new one in. But here's the challenge. If you have a lot of data on that machine, when you put the new drive in, the RAID array has to rebuild the, the safety of that drive. And that can take usually about a day. During that time, you're vulnerable. If something happens to a second drive, you literally lose everything you have. So although that's never happened to me, um, if it, it, when, the, when you're in that situation, you are sweating bullets. Please, God, just let this rebuild take place before anything else happens. And so yeah, you I've, been, I've been in that situation. Hey, as long as yeah. I have this up, John, let me, let me ask you a question. Yeah. By the way, Dave, I tried to share just this one window. I couldn't, so I'm having to share my whole desktop. Uh -huh. So this is the Drobo dashboard here for people that are uh, watching. These are those four drives that uh, John just showed us when he held them up. I've got four of these 750 gig drives. Okay. And uh, so this kind of shows the health and the status of everything. This is one nice thing. When you start using these tools like Drobo and some of the other ones we'll show, you get like all this extra information that normally is kind of hidden in the, uh, in the finder or whatever. So it's just nice to do a quick status check and see which ones you have to swap out and just kind of peace of mind looking at your data, I think. So, John, if I want to set mine up into double redundancy, you convinced me because I, I have been sweating bullets when I have a drive fail before. I know that feeling, not a good one. So how do I set this up into double redundancy? Go to Drobo Settings. Drobo Settings, okay. And dual disk redundancy, check the little box. All right. And then you hit okay. Do I want to do it? Is it going to slow down my whole computer? Should I do it after the show? It's not going to slow down your computer. What it's going to do, it, it, it will put some load on the Drobo, but n no load on your computer. All that's going to take place on the Drobo, but I don't know. I, I can't see how much data you have on that one. I don't think you have very much on it, do you? No. It looked like he did, though. When you oh, showed the high chart, I don't know if you had enough to... I have 1.1 uh, 1. 1 terabytes out of 2 terabytes used. Okay, so um, when you what what's going to happen is when you check that dual drive redundancy, you're going to lose uh, you're going to lose a significant amount of your free space. Yeah, but you're going to gain the dual drive redundancy, and so yeah, this is this kind of goes back to the other question you asked me, which I just realized I didn't finish answering. If you have that much space used on your mini, the next time you go out in the field, you, you don't have the room for it. So you are going to have to at least choose some of that stuff to migrate onto your permanent gig drives and you have dual drive redundancy, then basically half your drive space is redundancy. So you're going to end up with about 1.5 terabytes of total space, and you're using, what, 1.2? You'll be pretty full. You're muted. You'll Trey, you're muted. Um, yes, that's right, John. Okay, cool. So, I, have a, I have something oh, to add about. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, the last little point was that if you... If you find yourself in a situation where you've run out of room like that on the Drobo, you can pop out like one of the 750 gig drives and stick in a one terabyte drive, let it rebuild that data, do that with each of them, and you could migrate up to a, a larger size for the whole thing by doing that one at a time. But I, I wouldn't recommend that because that, that'll take you like at least four days to let it rebuild for everyone. <laughs> Move that data yeah. onto your other drive, then upgrade them, and then use it the way you want. Gotcha. Okay, go, Eric. 
Oh, one quick note about RAID and rebuilding. Um, you know, companies like Drobo and Synology have proprietary RAID setups, and you know, so you can do things like expand RAID, and you know, but a lot of people use old RAID setups like RAID five, you know, things like that, and it's really dangerous now. They are just not designed for the kind of data that we have now. And if you lose a drive in a RAID five setup, let's say you have single disk redundancy, you lose a drive. As John was saying, if another drive dies, of course you're vulnerable. But it's even worse than that because during rebuild, if a single bit is not read properly, it will not rebuild. So it's not about losing the drive. You lose one bit during that and you're screwed. And this is something I want to talk about when we get into this further. Um, but modern file systems just suck for, I mean, the, the file systems we use are terrible because they you have corruption. And this is something that I've been struggling with. A lot of my tech more tech-savvy friends are, are talking about this a lot. Uh, so when we get there, let's talk about uh, corruption, d data corruption. You know, backups do not solve for data corruption right now. Yeah, that, let me ask you real quick about that because my, uh, uh, so I use iPhoto actually as the final resting point for all of my portfolio pieces, right? I use Lightroom to, for everything, for the whole shoot and match and for working on the photos and this sort of thing. But then when I actually have the final photo, I like to put it in iPhoto for a variety of reasons. One, iPhoto is nice and fast. If it only has my portfolio pieces and it's super quick, I feel like Lightroom does get bogged down with a bunch of stuff on there. And also, I love how it integrates with my iPad and it's easy to up upload to places. Anyway, I just like iPhoto. But I've had a few scary moments over the past few months, actually. When I go back and look for old photos from four and five years ago, I think 90 Five percent of them are there, but every time now and then I go look for a photo, and I double click on it, and there's like nothing there. So I feel like there's like occasional corruption, and I'm missing it, and I feel like it's just some sort of cancerous thing that's slowly eating away at my old photos. Yeah, and in fact, that is happening. That's happening to everybody, all of us who use Macs or PCs with their default file systems. I mean, I. You know, there's a paper, and I'll, we'll post a link, I'll send it to you guys, and you can put, share it in the show notes, maybe. Uh, there's an article of one of my friends sent me by a guy named uh, Jim Gray. It's called Empirical Measurements of Disk Failure Rates and Error Rates. And basically it says that, you know, like SATA, you know, the, how we connect all of our drives, the, the spec advertises that if you read 10 terabytes, you will lose one bit. You have one bit that is uncorrectable as an error. And I back up you know, 12 terabytes basically every day. I mean, not, I don't copy it actively like that, but it's corrupting your data. And I have um, gone back to old pictures as well and found them unreadable in Lightroom. The raw file has mm. been corrupted, and I have to go back to my backups. But in fact, if I've been backing up actively since then, that corrupted file has now been backed up, and it's likely replaced all of, you know, that file in all of my backups. Right. So it's yes. a worry. <laughs> it is um. happening. <laughs> Well, maybe in that case, the cloud is actually a safer place for them. Version backups, anything that does versioning, CrashPlan does it. You know, a, a lot of cloud-based solutions do it. I, I think the real solution, when you have enough data to really worry about, is to use a file system like ZFS. You know, set up a Unix box that manages it. There are also these NAS boxes that run ZFS. You are guaranteed not to have corruption in that file system, and you can access it like you would a Synology box or something like that. It's not quite user friendly yet. You know, you have to be pretty technical to set it up. Um, but that's what—that's definitely where I'm moving. I mean, I found a corrupted image last week, and I, I don't like it. It's probably corrupted in all of my backups. You know, and it's. I know. It's I not cool. I was so worried. I had to. This I love this image, and I couldn't find it on my drive, so I had to go get it from Flickr like five years ago and download <laughs> it. I thought, man, what am I doing? Downloading original photos from Flickr back to my own library, and it's one that I happened to look for. So. Man, this ZFS sounds very uh, daunting. You should, are you going to write a blog post on it? I mean, it sounds important, but it sounds scary. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of research on it, um, you know, leaning on my, my more tech, friends who are more technical in file systems, and, uh, and I'll definitely write about it once I start setting it up. Yeah, yeah that sounds interesting. I, well, think free, I think FreeNAS uses ZFS, right, Eric? Yeah, there, there's a version of, of, there's some kind of free ZFS NAS that uses it. Yeah, FreeNAS is one of them. Okay, but well, again, now that we scared everyone to death. Um, <laughs> not accessible to many people. That's right. It's, it's definitely not accessible to most people. Hey, Peter, you were going to talk about your, your workflow. I think people would like to hear that. Sure. Um, 
So I've got sort of three pieces to my workflow. I've got uh, working images, which is basically right off the CF cards. Um, so, so when I go out and I do a shoot, get the CF cards, I import them locally onto MacBook Pro, which has a solid state drive. Um, and then from there, they get immediately backed up via a Thunderbolt um, uh, Buffalo drive, little portable uh, one terabyte drive that I have. Um, I've got two of those if it's a big shoot. So the, the idea is to have the data in three places as fast as possible. One on the CF cards, one on the SSD in the MacBook Pro, and the other one on the external Buffalo um, uh, Thunderbolt drive. And that's kind of my, that's kind of my working, working data. When I get back home, uh, I have a dedicated time capsule that just goes through and backs up the MacBook Pro's internal drive. Um, so as I'm working on images, I keep them local for a while, but they get backed up immediately to a second hard, another hard drive uh, over the network. Um, then when I'm done kind of processing them and working on them, I take that whole batch of photos and they all go to my, they all go to another system which stores my image, li my full image library. And that, uh, for that, I just, and I just redid that this year, I'm using two uh, G Drive Thunderbolt 8 terabyte um, uh, RAID arrays, but I don't actually use the RAID on this. So, and the reason for that is I don't need it yet. I don't need an eight terabyte disk yet. I only need a you know four terabyte disk. So what I so those two units give me four disk drives to store my library. So disk drive number one is the main copy. Disk drive number two and these are these RAID arrays are attached to a Mac Mini on my network. So what happens is is I'll drag the images and I use Capture uh, Capture One as my instead of Lightroom. But I'll, so I'll move the images via Capture One from my Mac, MacBook Pro to to the to the G Drive to drive to one of the drives on the one of the four drives, and then once it's there, I've got Time Machine running on the Mac Mini that does incrementals from drive number one to drive number two on the opposite RAID array. So instead of being in the same G Drive, I've got two identical G Drives but I alternate the copies. And then the other two um, disks on the G drive get snapshots. So what happens then is every week I do a full snapshot of the main data drive. And um, when I do a new one, it, the old one gets moved to the, um, uh, gets moved to the second, to the second drive. So I always have two full snapshots, which are basically two weeks, one week old and two weeks old one drive that has incremental copies as many as it can uh, as many as it can hold and then a fourth drive which stores is the main sort of working drive for the library so then after that the goal is to get it out of my house so what i do is i back up um, all everything that's a three star or above image in my library to amazon uh, s3 and glacier so Amazon S3 is a cloud storage service. You know, you could argue it's the biggest, the best, the most reliable. There's lots of other ones out there. I just use Amazon because I think it's got the best sort of pricing and feature set. And they have, you know, the, the problem with these cloud solutions is that it takes a long time to move the data to them. So if you want to get started, you can send them a hard drive or you can just, you know, kind of suffer through, you know, putting it over your Comcast pipe or whatever your DSL is. But, you know, for storing a terabyte at Amazon on S3, it's $76 a month just for one terabyte. But they have this other service called Glacier. And Glacier is designed for basically, um, it's sort of near line storage. It's like when you want to put something on ice, you don't need to get it back out anytime soon. They will store it for you for a much reduced cost. But if you want to get it back, it takes three to five hours for them to basically have the tape robot go pull up the tape and restore it to disk for you, which is fine for me because I don't ever want to get anything back from there unless there's a catastrophic failure. I'm happy to wait three to five hours in that case. Um, but the rate, the cost on that is really reduced, right? So 
S3 is sort of this, think of it as like an FTP drive where you can put stuff in and take stuff out. Glacier is just you put stuff in and then you got to wait a while. The Glacier cost is $10 a terabyte. So if you have 12 terabytes and you want for that on Amazon's infrastructure, which is basically means in two data centers on at least three to four devices, you're talking, you know, 12 terabytes would be 120 bucks a month, which is really incredible from a pricing standpoint, I think. Um, so I do that for every three star image and above that goes off um, on a job. I, I use transmit and I've got an automator action that moves that via transmit to S3 and then it sits in S3 for a day and then it goes to uh, Glacier at the end of the day. Peter, have you that, found the tools supporting Glacier yet? Like transmit, can you pu push directly to Glacier? So what happens is, is you push, you always push directly to S3. S3 is the interface and you go then, you log into your account on Amazon and you set up different folders in S3 to automatically archive to Glacier at certain points in time. You can, you can use a time-based policy. I think you can also use a size-based policy. So I just have it at the end of the day, move it to Glacier. Cool. Yeah. Hey, um, another question for you about transfer rates. You mentioned that you are backing up through the network to your Mac Mini with the attached Thunderbolt drives. What, <clears throat> what transfer rates are you seeing through the network between your Mac Pro and your Mac Mini? I've got a thousand base T network, so I think it's like 120, something like that. I, I haven't benchmarked it recently. Um, it's not wonderful. It's not the native um, Thunderbolt. But the reason I do that is because I want a um, Thunderbolt speed. If it was directly attached, it would obviously be faster. But because I push so many copies around, I've got a time machine doing an incremental basically in two places, and then I want to push it to S3 and Glacier as fast as possible. I really wanted to isolate my, the computer I used to work on files from that activity. But I got burned a long time ago when I first started. I had these network attached boxes. It was like a Linksys or some horrible NAS. And, um, you know, when there was a problem, I had to like crack open the thing and get the drives out and put them in enclosures and, you know, try to attach it via firewire back. The, the thing that I upgraded this year, which I really like is if I have any problem with any of these drives attached to my Mac mini, I can just attach them directly to my MacBook Pro and it doesn't really know any difference. So I like that so that I don't, I'm not dependent on like a proprietary piece in the middle to, you know, have to deal with when something goes wrong, which it does. That makes sense. The reason I was asking is because I've tried a similar setup with a Mac mini yeah. and had really terrible uh, network performance rates. Like I'm talking maybe getting 40, 45 megabits per second through a giggy, you know, full on giggy switch. And it seemed like the Mac mini itself was the bottleneck that, that I was fighting with. I haven't had that issue. My network is tends to be the bottleneck. Oh, okay. Hey, whatever you guys talk about, that's great. Stoking <laughs> uh, <laughs> that fire. But, you know, my, my workflow is like, you know, I've got, um, you know, call it 100 gig of images maybe that I'm moving around, you know, kind of at, at the max. That would be, you know, so it's, I tend to work on them, get tired of working on them, and then do the, you know, initiate the copy and go to sleep or get a cup of coffee or something like that. So I very much rely on batch windows to move the stuff around. If it takes an hour longer than it ought to, it doesn't really matter to me. Well, Wait, so you're yeah, that's one of the most hardcore workflows I've ever heard. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, you know, and then I hear that and I think, well, mine is pretty complex too, and it is so hard to explain to people. And, you know, we're incredibly computer literate or whatever. We do this our whole lives. But, you know, people that don't have the time to become experts on this stuff and figure it all out and the difference between S3 and Glacier and all this stuff, I mean, it's... Uh, what are regular people supposed to do? You know, it's tough. I would, I would say like, you know, if, if I were to sort of forget, you know, I think Eric said before, you got to figure out how much data you have to figure out the hardware. But the principle that I've tried to follow is that the data, the photos, 
or whatever the video needs to be on three devices in at least two locations. And depending on your data sizes, you may have lots of different technology, you know, array to array, single drives, you know, those can be your devices. You can those will come and go. But they've it's gotta be on three independent devices. It can't be on three discs in one device. Because I found the right. same problem as Eric talked about with raids going bad. And even before the restore happens, it's corrupted the data. So even before I, it's rebuilt, the reason it failed is because there was data corruption. So it, you can't just rely, you can't use the old adage of be on two or more hard drives. It's really got to be on, be on two or more devices. Um, and that's the rule that I kind of follow. So yeah, I, I, I right. hate to be the downer here, but the reason why people aren't backing up are because, well, some people aren't backing up, are because of conversations like we're having right now that are just <laughs> so way above their head. They're like, I'll get to it, and then, oh, never mind. I won't get to it. Let's just be honest. I'll just pray. Uh, you know what I recommend to my, my lay, lay friends, lay people friends, what, what do you call them? <laughs> I mean, if they, basically, almost all of them have less than, say, three terabytes of data. And that's, that's great. I mean, drives are four terabytes. Get two, and use them both with Time Machine, and take one to work every week, and just or two weeks, and just make it part of your workflow. The most important thing is making sure that the daily stuff is automated, and the offsite stuff is part of your routine. That's yeah. the most important thing. Now, if you're over three terabytes, well, then you have to listen to conversations like this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, That's and frankly, I don't, I don't think that it has to do so much with the amount of of data you're storing. In general, I also agree with the three, the three drive rule or three location rule. Everything we have is like triple redundancy. We have three copies of it. But the basic rule that I tell people who are uh, maybe avid amateurs is anything you feel is important enough to store is important enough to store in at least two places. So, you know, what, one of you guys, I, I, I can't remember, Eric, if it was you who just said this, but um, said, uh, you know, just get an extra drive. I mean, if you're going to go buy one of these, you never buy one. You always buy two. And then whatever you put on it, you just make copies. Even if it's as simple as, well, I can't automate it. So once a week or once a month, you can uh, plug in the second one and just copy everything to it, and then maybe stick it in a fire safe if you don't have an off-site off -site location to put it in, so that if the worst thing in the world were to happen, you only lose a month worth of incremental data or something like that, you know? Hey, so Scott, this is, what do you do that's, when you travel? That, that's a good, simple solution, yeah, because when I travel... I have uh, two of those little Costco Western Digital drives. They're tiny, and uh, they're both two terabytes. And I will make sure I have it in three spots. So I have them on the, the, the flash cards, the CF cards, and then I'll put them onto another drive. And then uh, every couple of days I'll put them onto the, the second drive because I can't just keep on doing this all day because when you're traveling, you've got things, other things to do. And as soon as they go on to the second drive, I will delete them off of uh, the CF cards so that I can keep continue to use the CF cards. Anytime that I leave the car, uh, I will take with me one of those small drives, even if just in my pocket. That's why they have to be super small, because I will have someone's work with me. And I may be in the middle of nowhere in Death Valley, so I can't, like, upload to the cloud or anything like that. Not that I do that anyways, though it's a good idea. Um, but I'll always have them with me because it might be someone's wedding pictures. I'm just like, I don't want my car to get broken into. But if they rob me, I want to have one in the car as well. So um, so I just, it's really simple. Just two drives and I just manually uh, put the stuff into different places. I don't have an automated system per se because I don't necessarily trust one, I guess. That's my travel solution. When you get home and you're dealing with, I guess, like 15, 16 terabytes of pictures, 
and a hundred, you know, the last backup solutions for the last six, seven years, as it's, you know, progressed, you're like, oh, remember when I used to do this, and now you have, like, four systems all intermingling? So, yeah, then it gets a little more complicated. And how about you, Cublin? When you're, um, when you're traveling, what do you do? What's your backup system? Well, when traveling, I just have a 500 gigabyte external drive that I'll just, um, I'll import the pictures from the compact flashcard into Lightroom, and then I'll also just make a second copy, transfer it over to this 500 gig drive. You copy so, your whole Lightroom library to the 500 gig? No, just the pictures that I've taken from that trip after I've imported them off the card into Lightroom, I'll then take those same pictures and transfer them over to this 500 gigabyte external drive. I see. Why don't you just go ahead and copy the whole Lightroom directory over to your 500 gigabyte drive? Have two copies, oh. one on your computer and the second on your drive. Take a long time, I guess. Well, I don't know that it's, that it's necessary. I've got all I'm trying, I've got the pictures in two places. The pictures are on the computer, and then they're also on this hard drive. I don't know why you would need to copy the entire Lightroom catalog onto it as well. Well, I just wondered as a backup. If you're backing up your photos, I thought you might also back up your Lightroom catalog. <laughs> I don't. Because well, yeah. so if you lose your catalog, Scott, you potentially lose all your keywording and your mark, your any edits you've done in Lightroom, you'll lose all that stuff. Unless but it's embedded in your backups. DMGs, then your edits are there. Well, I've got backups of my catalogs that I've taken from be right before when I've left, so I wouldn't lose that much. I'd just oh, okay. lose whatever from that trip that I keyworded. Yeah. All right, I'm sometimes sense. more worried about my catalogs themselves, and I have, like, a ton of different versions all over the place. I've had catalogs go bad or something like that, but I've got... I don't know, like 30 gigabytes of catalog, not including... Yeah, I worry about my catalogs, too. Here, I'll, uh, I'll grab my webcam and show you behind my computer. Okay, have low expectations, because it's really messy back there, okay? Don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, Sean, that is not believe Here we go, okay. So, so you're not really seeing everything here, but you're seeing about, I guess, 70% of it. Uh, oh, so many cords. Seen... What's that? That's so many cords. It's so messy. Isn't it? Don't judge me, Jeremy. Um, so my no. drive that you don't see here is I have a giant um, Drobo, one of the big ones. And that I have over in the main house. Uh, like Peter was saying, it's good to have a, your backups like in another location in case there's a fire or something like that. So I bring that over here about once a month and copy everything over and then take it back over uh, to another location. I need to keep it in the main house or a friend's house here in New Zealand. So anyway, what we have here, let me show you what's going on. Okay, up here is the Drobo Mini. This is a Promise Pegasus drive here, 12 terabyte drive. Uh, this is an IOSafe N2, which I'll talk about in a minute. And this is another Promise Pegasus 12 terabyte. Okay, here's basically what I have on them. Uh, this is my Drobo Mini. So I take this on the road with me. I've actually taken to put two key things on this. One is my iPhoto library, sort of my main iPhoto library, and my iTunes library. So I have this hooked into my, my big computer system here at home, my iMac. And so I basically read my iPhoto and my iTunes off of this. And if I take it on the road with me, I also run iPhoto and iTunes off of this as well. So it's just sort of my one-stop shop. Now I'll take my iPhoto and this sort of stuff and I'll back them up um, onto this drive right below it. Okay, this is sort of backup data. Uh, but the other thing that this, this big one has is it has all of my Lightroom stuff. Because my Lightroom is about three or four terabytes actually might be more like five terabytes. So it's, it's way too big for the Drobo Mini. Uh, but it's just right for this one. Okay? And then I back up my, my main Lightroom also over here to this, this Pegasus second one. Now this one in the middle, this is sort of the newest uh, child in the family. This is the Iowa State N2. 
and two. And I put the most important stuff on here as sort of a permanent backup. Uh, iPhoto, not my Lightroom, but my iPhoto and, and movies of the family and this sort of thing. And the cool thing about this situation is that it is fireproof and floodproof, which is super cool. So it can be totally submerged underwater and it's fine, or it, the whole place can catch on fire and it'll be fine. So um, this doesn't have quite as much space on it. Um, I could put more drives in it, of course, but uh, I just I don't right now. So anyway, that's that's a little bit of my system behind the curtain. I don't even know why you need a fireplace to generate heat in that place. <laughs> so what are you doing for offsite backup, Trey? Oh, for offsite, well, I put stuff up on SmugMug, kind of my portfolio. But I haven't really come up with a good cloud solution for my other, you know, four or five terabytes. I'm not sure what to do, frankly. Um, I might do this thing that uh, Peter mentioned with Glacier. I've been thinking about that. Um, I might upload it all to uh, Google Drive. I haven't, um, I haven't really decided. But that one thing that Peter said when he started talking about cost, I could see people thinking, "Whoa, you know, 120 bucks a month if you have 12 terabytes." Well. Most people don't have 12 terabytes. That's pretty rare. But, I mean, even if you have three or four terabytes on Glacier, you're talking an extra $30 or $40 a month. And I think that's sort of a, a cost that seems high just because we're not used to paying it. But at some point, people realize how important their data is. And then you think, well, of course I'll pay an extra $30 or $40 a month to protect my data because you don't realize how important it is until it's gone. And then it's just sort of one of these costs I think we're all going to have to get used to paying extra money into the cloud to store our most important stuff for us to keep it safe. And I, um, you know, I'm, I'm with you, Peter. I generally trust Amazon um, and their redundancy to keep my, my stuff safe for me. I trust Google. I trust Flickr. You know, they do a terabyte free. There's a lot of these big companies that I, that I kind of trust to be around for the next five years. Or if they start going down in flames in four or five years, I think I'll have time to get my data off and put it on something else that's... Uh, it's doing all right. Yeah, I agree. I think of it like an insurance policy. And, you know, for your images, it's like you spend thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars in travel or time or whatever to produce this stuff, um, you know, to spend another 20 bucks to really make sure you can always have it. Um, the other cool thing about Glacier and, and the cloud stuff is if you ever need to get an image and you're on the road, you can also grab it from there. So you can get it from anywhere, you know, instead of having to go back into your home network and things like that. There's one other option that we haven't really explored, and I think most people either are unaware of or they, um, I think I think most people just are not aware of, which uh, was mentioned earlier, Crash Plan uh, is a piece of software that you can run on your local machine uh, it allows you to back up. It allows you to choose backup locations, whether they're in a cloud environment, like uh, Crash Plans cloud in a data center, or whether it's other local machines or local drives attached to machines. A technique that I've thought of, uh, would would work really well for a lot of people would be. If you buddy up with someone else that has similar needs, um, I mean, for example, Trey, you, you would say that you wanted to get all that data uh, off-site, and we had extra capacity in, in our, you know, facility at GeekBeat. You could, uh, we could do kind of a trade where we put extra drives at your location. You put them at our location, and then we could use Crash Plan for free to back up to each other's locations through the networks. Now, the, the bad news in that case is it requires more infrastructure cost up front because you have to duplicate the hardware you have off-site. The good news is once you've done that, a, there are no monthly costs, with the exception of the bandwidth uh, that you know you, you're already probably paying for. Uh, and B, 
you still own and control all of your content, all of your data. It's not being trusted to someone you don't know. Um, you know, it's sitting in your friend or your your mother's house or something like that. So that's also an interesting option that people could use. And it's Trey, Trey, do you remember that you and I talked about that probably two years ago? Yeah, we thought about doing crash plan, and I've had a lot of people offer to do crash plan with me, but I haven't done it because, um, a like like uh, John said, there is sort of extra infrastructure cost uh, and something else to think about, like another big box to think about all the time. Like, okay, you know, is uh, Scott, you know. Uh, going to move, or does he still have my box okay? Or even my mom, if I were to put it on my mom's so like, well, did my mom turn the thing off? You know, does she know how to turn it back on? So it's something I would worry about all the time, I think, with crash plan. And I'm, I'm actually much more comfortable with using like Amazon S3. Even though I have to pay more per month, I think I'm, you know, I trust Amazon to be around in five years or Google to be around in five years. I think these are, uh, so JP in the chat room also mentioned uh, Backblaze and Carbonite. Those are two others. Uh, there's a lot of these uh, companies that uh, are in the business of protecting your data. And I've I think used a lot of I've used a lot of those. The only problem with those is the initial backup can take up to like two months, and I just do not have the patience to to. Well, you, some of those will let you send drive send a seed drive to them. Yeah, you can do that. Account, yeah. I have a totally different opinion of those services than you guys do, and. Primarily because some of you may know, most of you probably don't know, before I was doing what I'm doing now, I used to be an executive with uh, data uh, hosting companies. So uh, I've got firsthand inside knowledge of uh, big data storage, data centers, and things like that. And generally speaking, yes, you can uh, trust them. However, Exceptions occur. You know, things happen. We've seen even with Amazon S3 where they've had outages that have been reported with data loss, and their explanation that they come back with is it, it affected a very small percentage of our customers, which is true on a percentage basis, but you might still be talking about hundreds or thousands thousands of customers who lose partial or complete data and you see this happen all the time it's anytime you're dealing with hard drives you you run that same risk so I don't know I I feel like they're safe the good thing is they are managed by professionals and they're managed at a scale that is much larger but the bad, the bad news is that when something happens, and it, it does happen, they just don't care. And uh, you, you're a number to them, and that just, to me, counts for something. So I don't know. It would be nice if you had a location where you could trust and put your own data, and, and that would be that. Also, by the way, uh, this reminds me of another interesting little project. If you don't have huge backup needs, this is fantastic for the masses. There's a product called Transporter, and it's a tiny little device. It's uh, got a one, I think you might be able to get a two terabyte drive in it now. And it's this little device you put in your network, and you can put extra ones in as many places as you want. I mean, literally, you could put them in a hundred different locations, and the software, it's a web-based control panel, the software will let you pair them up and replicate either all or portions of the data across these drives. So if you don't have big needs, that's a great way to essentially build your own little cloud that you can trust. It's like your own private Dropbox, basically. It is. It's what it is. I've seen that, John. It's. I, I think actually the guys that started that are former Drobo guys. Yeah, Jeff Bar Barrell, who was the C the original CEO of Drobo, uh, left and he formed that company. And let's see, um, uh, pub what has been publicly stated 
Uh, right now, you guys may have heard Drobo and Transporter are going through a merger. Uh -huh. And Jeff is coming back to take over as CEO of Drobo again. And I think that's all I officially know. Um, <laughs> Uh, so there may be some interesting things happening in the future with that stuff. That would have been cool. Um, sounds interesting. Uh, in fact, I, we were actually, uh, I'm sure we could have gotten like some free Drobos to give away tonight, but then everyone thinks we were sponsored by Drobo or whatever. So we just did. Sorry, audience, but we could have given you one, but then everyone suspects we have ulterior motives. Um, what do you want? What so, would we give one away for? I don't know. I've got one to give away. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have we'll have him tune in to Geek Beat and you can give it away there. All right. All right. Hey, uh, uh, well, so I agree with what you said, John. And I know that with these big companies, that you are just a number at some point, and there's very little personal care given in these disaster things. But you know, that's why it's just one of your three legs. If that one goes belly up, like if Amazon goes belly up. Like, oh man, they screwed me. I really trust Amazon. Then then maybe I take my data, I upload it to Yahoo Flickr. You know, I've still got a ton of storage over there and they have a terabyte free with their new one and I have, I'm grandfathered in because I've been there for so long, just like a lot of other pros. Uh, but that's a good place and I would go with Yahoo Flickr for a while. So that's I think that's the good reason to do what Peter said and everyone's been saying, Eric, and all of us, but put it in three places and then if one of them goes horribly awry, then just find a new third place. You know, there's lots of options out there. I think the number of options will just continue to grow. Um, well, does anyone? A lot of the photo out? places don't. Uh, a lot of the photo places are more about JPEGs, right, and not RAWs. Well, that's true. Yeah. A lot of the photo places. Also, a lot of the photo places also just use S3. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> Hey guys, I have a couple of recommendations really quickly uh, to make the stuff we're talking about uh, more, uh, maybe not drive you nuts. I mean, one of the things about Crash Plan, um, which I've set up at quite a few of my friends' places, uh, is that if you just install it and turn it on and have it back up to the cloud and you're on, say, a DSL connection, your connection at home will effectively just go down. Because if you fill your upload bandwidth, your download bandwidth is gone too. So, you know, I always recommend, like, get a technical friend to come over and test your connection, set it up the right way so it doesn't eat all your bandwidth up. That is, just take advantage of your friends. Someone in the chat room said take them all out and offer them a drink. Do that, you know, leverage your technical friends. Um, and then, and the second thing was, you know, when we were talking about this travel stuff and, and Scott was talking about just manually copying um, files from one drive to the other. I rely on you, you know, on on software a lot because I can't. It's everything's incremental. If you're out for you know two months and you're adding pictures from a shoot to a folder, you know, I've seen people just drag that entire folder over every time, and it gets you know it takes longer and longer every day. And so, you know, there are programs like ChronoSync for the Mac or Beyond Compare for Windows, and you set up a source, you set up two folders, and you say back up in one direction, back up the other direction synchronize them, you know, they're really powerful to save you a ton of time. If you took one gig of photos and you're adding to it, you know, 100 gig backup, it'll take you 30 seconds, it won't take you, you know, many, many minutes. I love those suggestions. Beyond Compare PC, huh? Yeah, Beyond Compare 2, and then Mac people use ChronoSync. Typically. And what about the hardware that people are using to put their stuff on? Uh, I talked about just the, when I'm traveling, but, you know, I got the drop old Drobo Pro, but I hear really good things about the Drobo 5D now, and I need something else because I'm like full on my Drobo Pro with like 13, 14 terabytes on there. And so seeing Trey's IOSafe and Pegasus and Drobo, which ones, which one do you like for mass storage, Trey? Uh, I like, well, I think they're all basically equal. Um, I frankly had a little bit more success with my uh, Promise Pegasus than I have my Drobo. Mm -hmm. um, although I don't really know what to attribute that to because hard drive failures are hard drive failures. And I can't really blame Drobo for those, although I happen to have had a few more with my Drobo than the Promise Pegasus. I did have one Promise Pegasus drive go out though. 
and they just sent me a new one in a drawer and I slid it right in and it synced up for about 12 hours and everything was okay again. Um, but I've had more uh, failures with my Drobo. Uh, but since I've gotten these new Thunderbolt ones, they seem much more steady and obviously I'm still using them. Uh, the Drobo Mini is, is very fast and obviously I've got uh, everything backed up on my big Drobo. Which, which Drobo do I have, John? The, my big one, it's a 5N, 5D? No, I think you got the eight, the eight bay one, right? That that's sideways. No, or no, sixteen. No. I have, I have no. one of the new Thunderbolt ones. Oh, then that's the five D. The five D. Right. Yeah. So yeah. obviously, I like the five D, and I'm using it. It's um, it's over in the main house. And one of the cool things about the five D that I've noticed, yep, Jarvi, you have a Mac, right? No, I have PC. Oh, well. I think that was well, the best thing about Pegasus. the 5D is that it was uh, Thunderbolt. Does it have USB 3 also, John? It does. Oh, okay, so you'll be fine. But, you know, so it's got all those, you know, old spinny hard drives, but it also has this little uh, SSD card that goes in the bottom of it that seems to do super fast caching. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's like the whole thing is an SSD. Power. And I hear it has backup power. Does it? I'm not aware of backup power for it. I think it has. It's only got a single power supply. That's that's for certain. Um, it may have like a small little battery inside yeah, that of it. Helps it shut down if it loses power. Yes, yes, that 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 it does. Yeah. But you know what? Um, for you know, Scott, in your case, because you've got so much stuff, I think you're a lot more similar to what we are and a lot of these boxes and devices we've been talking about and looking at are what I would consider consumer level um, storage it might be time for you to consider a, a bigger one you know um, like but now I'm on the verge of uh, going on a year-long road trip too so it becomes a little more tricky yeah, uh, for for travel purposes, that's a whole that's a whole different ball game. But I mean, the long term storage issue. At some point, you may want to look into something that's uh, a larger, like eight or twelve bay device. And you know, Drobo makes some, Synology makes some, um, QNAP makes some. They're they're at a different price point, but they're also at a different feature and performance level as well. So. You know, one of the challenges that we have is we're moving so much data around, and I think you know Scott and others have have said, I just don't have time. I don't have time to to wait for all that data. That's a big challenge once we start getting these very large uh, storage sizes. You know, when you're moving terabytes around, even through gigabit networks, it's not very fast. So uh, it could take days to transfer this stuff. You, you don't want to be having to have, like Trey has their, you know, three or four boxes. Well, that's okay until you need to move four terabytes from one box to another, and it's going to take a week or more to do that because of the limitations, you know. Yeah, w by the way, with Thunderbolt, for everyone that's Thunderbolt curious, I found, because I am always moving, um, you know, terabytes back and forth quite a bit, and it to copy pretty much, I would say, I don't know, let's say seven terabytes from one to the next, um, I can usually do it in less than a day with Thunderbolt, which is pretty good, and usually I don't move that much, uh, but it's so quick, and it, pretty much everything in the system is Thunderbolt. So it's uh, it's quite um, it's quite simple and fast to move stuff around. That's, That's the Thunderbolt the has totally changed my life. The benefit of direct attached storage as opposed to network attached storage, yeah. because if you compare that, for example, to one of these network devices, the best you could do in the budget range we're talking about would be something that offers multiple gigabit ethernet ports and can bond them together and you might end up with 300 megabits worth of transfer rate uh, which is a fraction of Thunderbolt and requires a lot of things for example 
you've got to have a network switch that's capable of bonding those things, and then you've got a machine that has at like a like a Mac Pro with three Ethernet adapters or two Ethernet adapters, so they can be bonded. So network transfer takes a long time with any of these storage devices, uh, which is why you shouldn't do it unless you really need it. You should stick with the 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 direct attached storage so you can use Thunderbolt or USB 3.0. Yeah, I think that's a much simpler way to do it. I'll, I'll show people this thing really fast so they can see what this system is like because it's new to me. I'm used to the easy-to-use Drobos and Pegasus and that sort of thing. But this is, um, this is that IO safe. This is the fireproof, um, uh, uh, waterproof one. They've got all this, uh, these pictures on here that going crazy. That's kind of what it looks like. But the, the system for putting your files on there is not totally intuitive. You can't just use a finder and drop them on there. But you have to open this thing up inside of a, a web browser, and then you get this sort of, you know, I feel like a, a network administrator from the late 80s with these windows. And um, so you kind of you can go in here to iPhoto Backup, and then when you want to upload something, you click Upload, and then you you go find the thing you go find the file and and then it uploads and so it's just not quite as slick as using uh, Finder and stuff. It's, um, it's actually you you shouldn't be having to do that to upload your files. You should what well, you're you're right in that you have to go into here and you have to s create new file share folders and assign permissions to them. You may yeah. not have assigned your permissions yet. But once you set that folder and you give it permissions to allow everyone to uh, everyone on your network to access it, you should be able to find it in Finder as a network drive and access it like any other network drive. Oh, that's good information. Thank you, John. Yeah, that will save you a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah, because it's taken forever for me to get stuff uploaded. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well. Uh, if uh, we can wrap this up, does anyone have any final uh, golden nuggets of backup truth they want to drop on the crowd? I would say the only other trick I found was, yeah. you know, hard drives die, um, you know, a painful death after they've been spinning a really long time. So, you know, if you really want to make your hard drive last, don't keep it on all the time. So um, if you can, turn it off um, and if, or put it to sleep. If the, your system supports sleep, that'll extend the life of it a lot too. Yeah, good idea. All right, well let's let's jump in and start uh, sharing photos, and then we always have some discoveries of other photographers we found that we want to share with the world. Um, so who wants to start sharing? I always I always go last. I got, I finally got a good photo of the moon, by the way, that I'll share. Thank God, it's okay photo. But I got it of the super moon here in New Zealand, so I'll show that during my my share time. Um, I'll go, who wants I'll go to go first? first? You Any volunteers? I'll go first. Are you, if you, are you want. raising your hand? Yeah. I can't. I can't see when you're raising your hand. You have I'll to go first. Yell. I'll go first. I'm yelling. Okay, share. Go. All right. Here's a macro in my backyard. Nice. Whoa! I thought that might be a close-up of Jarvie sleeping at night. No, it's just like a little pine tree thing, and oh, I whipped out I thought my. Those uh, were his long, beautiful eyelashes. Yes, yes. I whipped out my 60 millimeter macro with two extension tubes and just got real close on that. Just playing around. Very cool. This is up uh, near Bear Mountain, New York, looking over the Hudson River is kind of out of view, but it's there. Another angle. Now this is on the other side of where where I was at that point. This is, um, I think it's the Bear Mountain Bridge, and that's the Hudson River. There's the Hudson River again. And again, and I think there's Indian Point nuclear power plant in the top left. This I took last night, or two nights ago with uh, Jarvi. We went to the Rampo Reservation in Mawa. Another one from there. And there's Jarvi being, being epic. And that's it. Being epic. <laughs> that's awesome. Looks like a giant gun. It does. It's like a huge elephant rifle. Okay. 
Uh, we'll just go left to right. Eric, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, in about a month, I'm getting ready to go back to Isla Mujeres, this little island off of Cancun, you know, in the in the Gulf of Mexico there, and I'm going to the largest aggregation of the largest fish in the world. So these are whale sharks. Uh, we typically have a few hundred of them on the surface together at once. So I have pictures with, you know, 60 fins sticking out of the water. These are very big sharks. They're, you know, up to 35, 40 feet long. And on average there, they're maybe 20 feet long, 24 there. And um, it's a really great place to photograph these things. No scuba diving is necessary. You just snorkel and free dive. Uh, they're feeding on tunny spawn. It's like a bonito tuna. And, um, and so you just, you can just swim up to them. They open their mouths. You can get creative and shoot splits like this on the surface. Um, you can kind of photograph these all you want. Um, of course, if you're in, in the right group, uh, you know, dedicated for photography, most of the boats out there are just kind of tourist boats. Uh, so super excited going there in about a month. That's amazing. That's crazy. That was from and a previous trip. Eric, you do so many things. You're so, uh, you're like one of the most type A photographers I know. Type A? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you do Those so many things like quadcopters, awesome. you're underwater, you're doing light There's Everything is always happening around you, Eric. Yeah, it's, I, I try. <laughs> it's fun. I can't help but be dragged into my, all of my interests. Well, you do it all so well, which is confounding that you seem to excel at everything you do, so that's awesome. Anyway, well, I have less up. time now because I got married, <laughs> but I'm very happy. To be married. Yeah, yeah. Do you have kids yet? <laughs> Not yet. No, I'm sure that will that will be the right. the, the second nail. Less you know, productive soon. Okay. Yes, uh, right. John P. Go. All right. Let me see if I can remember how to screen share this thing here. Are you going right. to show us more photos of girls holding you in the air? Oh, that would be good. Uh, I don't think I have any at this at this second. They all go on my Google Plus. So, all right. Well, here's uh, I do have only three pictures to share with you guys today. This one that we're looking at right here. Uh, this is I just snapped this. This is after this afternoon. This is Eastern State Penitentiary. Penitentiary. How do you say that damn word? Penitentiary. Jam. Prison. The prison. Eastern State in uh, right here in Philadelphia. Well, I'm in New Jersey, but in, it, it's in Philadelphia. This is a prison that was built in the 1800s. It operated for 140 years. It shut down in the 70s, and it sat uh, vacant for decades and went into absolute ruin. So I, I've got a few other photos, but this is the upstairs uh, ledge of one wing and you're seeing the cell doors on either side, left and right there. And then if you look down on the first level below, you can see more cell doors. And this was a very scary, scary place you would not want to be stuck at. Um, let's see what else we got here. This next one, this is one I shot uh, a couple days ago. Oops, wrong one. Shot this a couple of days ago at Rock City in Chattanooga, Tennessee. A beautiful, beautiful outdoor area. Uh, this was a waterfall, obviously, that was there. There were many others, lots of water, lots of beautiful rock formations. Uh, a lot of other cool things to see and do in Chattanooga, including Ruby Falls, which is an indoor uh, it's a cave with a 150 foot waterfall in the middle of it, so that's nice. This third one, this one I shot uh, maybe about a month ago, but I really like this picture. This was a Grand Cherokee SRT that Jeep loaned me to test out. 470 horsepower, ridiculously, ridiculously fast Jeep. And what I did was I took it downtown in Dallas uh, at midnight and parked it in a little vacant lot with, as you see, some of the skyscrapers behind me. Set up the tripod with, a, uh, with the camera. No light, no flash or anything, but set a long exposure, 30-second exposure. 
and I walked around and did some light painting with a uh, LED light. I just kind of painted the front of the vehicle to light it up, and then I walked behind it and kind of pointing it at the camera, made that little light stream behind it. And I just really loved the way it turned out. So. Looks good. Hey, uh, in the comments, uh, who is that? Ben Rothig? He, yeah, said he doesn't ben. normally like HDR, but he loves that shot. Oh, well, good. Thank you. There you go. All right, Peter, you want to go next? Yeah, let me uh, pull up. Okay. Um, this is um, some commercial work I did. Uh, this is a portrait series of big wave surfers uh, at this year's Mavericks um, International. So Mavericks, you know, it's like 60 to 100 foot wave type big, big surfing. These All these guys were, and gals were out there kind of competing. Um, we did portraits on the beach um, for a lot of them. This is sort of some of those guys. Um, next couple shots are some personal work. This is my vampire bear. Um, this was shot at a street festival in San Francisco uh, called the How Weird Festival, one of the best street fairs ever. Highly recommend uh, anybody in San Francisco go to that. I think, Eric, you were there, weren't you? I think you were shooting there too, weren't you? Yeah, uh, in the past. Then San Francisco has a lot of other um, cool fairs. This was a superhero kind of street fair. Um, so just doing a lot of portrait work, personal stuff there. Um, this was a fun shot that we did on a photo walk. This is Lisa from Google. Um, and we were doing uh, Dragon Ball poses. This is kind of the, this inter this meme was going around a, long, um, you know, a couple weeks ago. It's basically Japanese schoolgirls recreating the sort of like death blows that happen in Dragon Ball, which is sort of an anim a very popular an Japanese anime series um, and movie series. Um, so you kind of pose people you catch them jumping and it kind of looks like the chi force of one of the people is sort of blowing up the other people. So we set up a bunch of flashes and, um, and did this at Stanford one night, um, a couple other shots as well. It was a good time. Um, I'm in Silicon Valley. So this is actually first my, one of my, my favorite aerial shots. This is a recent one that I got to take of the South Bay, um, and the peninsula. Um, uh, sort of at dusk, which is pretty cool. Um, I got this actually out of a commercial airliner, which I was pleased about. Um, these are a couple shots from stories that I did. This is a story about Adobe and Creative Cloud. Um, this is actually in Adobe headquarters uh, in San Jose. Um, this was another one for Stanford. Um, this is uh, Stanford Memorial Church at night. Um, this was one for Tesla, sort of rise of electric cars, um, and sort of how they're taking over, um, especially here in this area. Um, and then I'm from New York, actually was back uh, doing some, uh, seeing some family and stuff and shot some personal stuff. This is the oldest uh, Jewish delicatessen in New York, Katz's Deli, uh, over 125, year, 125 years old uh, this month, actually. Um, down on Houston Street, um, and another um, sort of cityscape um, looking down towards Midtown, uh, mid, uh, Midtown Manhattan. That's awesome. Cool. What did you shoot that with? This is fit, shot with the Phase, Phase 1. Yeah. Um, these are shot with the Sony RX1, all of these actually. And then all the, all the portrait work is done with, I do with the Phase 1. Awesome stuff. Thank you. Jarvi. All right. All right. Share my screen. Okay. Yes. Go for it. Okay. I'm on my laptop, so I don't have most of my computers. And I'm just staying with Dave, so I didn't really know I was going to be here. And we can see my stuff, right? Yes. All right. So. Uh, I was going to share this one because I am uh, missing out on this this last weekend since I came here. All my friends went down to Moab. There about 200 friends went down there, and a bunch of them have Jeeps, and I have a bunch of friends that go Jeeping. So this guy just loves 
taken me down there because he knows it's going to get some fun shots like that one. And let's see here. And this one, which I, uh, it was pretty cool. 30 second exposure lit up the Jeep as well. How did you do that with the person in there? I had him, I told him, right in, be really still <laughs> when I'm doing the flash. How did you have to shoot that to get it right? I think that was probably like the third or fourth, but I mean, uh, it, we did it quite a few times, and I finally got it uh, figured out when I went to this side because I had him turn on the lights on the car like super fast, turn them on and off as fast as you can. And then I had a run and round uh, flashing the car with my speed light. Such yeah. a cool shot, Jeremy. You're just manually popping it? You're walking around and manually just popping the flash? Yeah, as fast as I can in 30 seconds in pitch dark. <laughs> so I couldn't run too fast or I'd fall. So that was awesome. like a month or so ago. And then uh, recently I've gotten back into doing a lot of weddings recently. So this couple was particularly fun because we went, we shot pictures of them at the farm, at a kid's little library, and at a Taco Bell because she loves Taco Bell. So, And then uh, what's been fun is uh, started, uh, I just started a Kickstarter. So I have someone help me out on the Kickstarter that's putting all of my pictures. I said, here's a gallery of pictures, and you can go, sorry, it just stuck on this picture, uh, and put quotes with it. So, like, uh, it was kind of fun that he wanted to do that. So he put quotes with a lot of my pictures. And uh, it's kind of fun reliving them, so. That's what I've been doing recently. What's your Kickstarter? I am going on a year-long road trip, and I am uh, photographing religious buildings. So, yeah. I And, and then I'll be making a book about that and uh, travel in lots of different places, all 50 states. Can we Very link cool. it up in the uh, chat? Eric, yeah. uh, Eric, you have a, a thing that you're doing? Do you want to talk about that publicly, or was that just in chat? Oh, oh yeah, publicly. I'll wait to the end, though. Yeah. Can we do one more? Yeah. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll mention it really quickly. Um, so I run underwater photography trips, and this uh, whale shark trip is one of them, although it's full. And um, so what I wanted to do was just uh, talk for one minute about a trip I'm running to Komodo, Indonesia in February. It's a dive trip. Uh, the area around Komodo is known for its dragons, but the, the water around it is incredibly productive for underwater photographers. And so if you're interested, it's wetpixel.com slash expeditions. And uh, we have a few spots free. It's February 2014. I just wanted to plug that. Thank you. Of course, you bet. Um, Scott Cublin, share. OK. Your turn to go. Why is my Lightroom not showing? Show. Don't know. There we go. You can see it now, right? Yes. Well, I just thought I would share this photo since the recent announcement of the next New Zealand photography workshop. This is from the it's last not, one. It's not public yet uh, there, my friend. All right. Well, I won't say the dates then. Well, we only, we only put it out there to a few people, the uh, people that subscribe to the newsletter, the free newsletter. They, they know about it, but I haven't announced otherwise. But it's okay. You let it slip a little bit. Go on. Okay. Um, so, well, here's just another shot from New Zealand at the last workshop. There's another shot. That was not the workshop, but that's just one of the nights that we all went over to Mount Cook and got these incredible shots of the Church of the Good Shepherd. Uh, I think mine was better than yours, Trey. Uh, yours is very nice, Scott. <laughs> I, think, I think Karen beat us all. 
Oh, Karen had a very nice shot, too. Yeah. Uh, this is Lake Sumter down in the villages in Florida. They've just got some incredible um, sunsets there. In fact, I was with Curtis there, and it really looked like it was not going to be a nice sunset. Usually you can tell when it's going to be a really colorful sunset, and this night it didn't. But I, I told Curtis, he was ready to leave. I said, let's just give it 10 more minutes. And then this, this sky just lit up. Uh, this is another place that we went to. Oh, gosh, what was the name of it? I think it's Boone's. Oh, I better look and see what I call it. Let me just. I can't even look at my keywords for it. Boone Hill Plantation, I think. It's one of the places that we went to. And uh, I had to do a lot of posts to this. There were some people standing around here that I had to remove. This is just a real estate shot. I'm, I've gotten back into real estate recently, and I just wanted to kind of show what, um, what type of look you can get if you do proper HDR for uh, interior shots uh, with real estate. And some of them look a little painterly, but you know, you're, you're capturing the detail of what's outside as well as the, the um, proper light levels on the inside. What kind of lens yeah. is that? That was um, probably a 17 to 40, I think. I think that's what my wide angle is. There's a 16 to 35, then there's a 17 to 40, right? Yeah. That would have been a 17 to 40. And that's just uh, another view, just with the kitchen. I just think it really helps to sell a property um, if you take proper pictures on the inside. So I just wanted to share that. And then this one, um, for the first time, somebody actually asked me to go and take a picture for them. They wanted a picture of this church during the sunrise. And uh, I agreed to do it. So I went down there last week. I had to wake up at 5.15 in the morning drove to downtown Savannah and approached this at many different angles and ended up going with this one. And uh, I think it turned out really nice. Good. Did they like Especially, it? Were they satisfied? Yeah. But, you know, of course, there was a bunch of changes they wanted made to it, which is the reason why I usually don't like to do this. But, uh, they were like, well, can you show me what it would look like from the front? <laughs> 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 well, I could. I've, I've got that one. You can't see anything in the sky at all, but if you want to see that, my picture from the front, and then I just sent her the raw, unprocessed shot, she's like, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> Always a good tactic. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, I just think this is a, a great shot of this church, and uh, you know, there were some street signs that I had to remove, uh, quite a few street signs, and then I darkened the sides here just because it was a little bit distracting, but... I mean, for the picture of that church, I think it turned out really nice, especially if you saw the church, because the church doesn't look that good. And uh, that's it. All right. Thank you, Scott. Okay, here we go. I'll share a few. Just seven today. Um, so here's the um, moonshot I got this morning. Actually, this is the moon setting it set uh, really early this morning. You can see the sky was still sort of this pinky purple color. And this is it setting behind uh, one of the mountains behind my house. Um, so I'm glad actually everything was the right level because the other night when the moon came up, it was so dark um, that you basically got nothing else but that super bright moon. So I was glad I was able to do this just with one exposure. This was with the NEX 7 um, zoomed in at 3 310 millimeter. Um, by the way, I know people are still waiting for this thing I'm doing, this uh, little article I'm writing comparing the NEX7 and the, and the Nikon and what my decision ultimately is and, and all the weak points of the NEX versus the strong points of the D800 and vice versa. Um, by the way, Sony is also very interested in this thing that I'm writing. They talked to our team. They they actually offered us uh, free uh, unlimited cameras and lenses, all we wanted, uh, but we, um, we said no. Um, we didn't want to do that because, uh, you know, it just wasn't worth it. I want people to know I'm totally objective about this stuff, and the Sony cameras, they're cheap enough anyway. They're not that expensive. So, um, 
But anyway, that's uh, sort of the latest in this saga. Uh, so I want to go ahead and get this review out in the next few weeks if I have a chance. Uh, but it's, I think you'll like it. I think it'd be very informative to people. Because um, I did figure out all kinds of stuff when I really hit it hard. Um, here's a photo uh, from where the man to my left uh, lives. This is Savannah, Georgia. Uh, that's his hometown. Uh, this is a place called Wormslow. You might remember it from, this is the road that uh, Forrest Gump ran down. And I did something different with this shot. This is actually, I don't even know if there's a word for it, um, but I call it a, a tunneling panorama. Uh, because what I did is, instead of going side to side with my panorama, I started walking down the street. And when I created the photo, it, you can just go deeper and deeper and deeper down here. And I kind of layered it. So it's got tons of detail. I can go way down the road. Uh, it doesn't have that much detail if you zoom into like the other parts, like the leaves and this kind of stuff. But as long as you zoom down the middle, it's got a really cool depth. So that was just sort of an experiment. Uh, here's one. This is from uh, Disney World. Um, this is uh, one of the, this is in the Chinese area of Epcot. I thought it was pretty at night. Um, Here's one I just took a few days ago. This is in between Tekapo and Queenstown. I pulled over and took a photo. This is uh, in Angkor Wat. This is in Cambodia several years ago. Uh, this is from uh, Japan. There's a little snow monkey in Nagano. I think they're cute. And here's the last photo I'll share. I took this one a few days ago also in Tekapo. I stopped on a a bridge there and took a photo and actually I recorded the whole thing kind of the behind the scenes and uh, Scott and I have been editing this together so we did like how I set up for the shot and the lens and also all the post-processing of Lightroom and Photoshop and all that jazz so anyway that's some stuff we're working on behind the scenes but uh, it'll come out soon enough okay so I will oh I will now change my screen share this may crash but I was going to show my my uh, selection for the day, or my Google Plus Photographer Discovery. So if it does crash Dave, uh, then Eric can share his while I get my act together, okay? Well, we'll have, to, we we'll have to wait for you to come back because the broadcast cuts oh, out if you leave. You have to wait? Yeah. Oh, it didn't crash. All right. Okay, so where's my browser? Here we go. Okay. Do you guys see that? Yes, sir. So this is my um, Discovery. Uh, her name is Lace Anderson. Actually, I don't know anything about her uh, other than she takes pretty pictures. Uh, but sometimes that's all you need to know about somebody. Uh, so check her out. I think she lives in Hawaii. Um, actually, th again, this might be one of these people that everyone knows except for me. Um, and I just kind of stumble onto them and think, oh, this is really nice stuff. I mean, she might be incredibly famous for all I know. I don't know. But, but maybe she should be because look at these photos. It's my kind looks of stuff. Like, looks like Kauai. I dig it. It does look like Hawaii. So I don't know if she lives there. She just takes a lot of photos there. Um, but go go check her out. She's got a good eye. Good post-processing. Two things I like. Okay, I will unscreen share. Did that work, Dave? Yes, Am I still you're alive? in. You're still here. Fantastic. It's very hit or miss, this thing, when it crashes. Okay, we'll go, uh, we'll go opposite direction. Uh, Scott, do you want to share first? Sure. Okay. Okay. You see my screen all right? Yes. Yes. Okay, this Jim Shoemaker. I'll just go through some of his pictures randomly here. I don't think there's too much done in post on most of these, um, but it was just, uh, he just has a lot of images that just have that really good feel to them. And look at that one there. Even in black and white, nice mirror reflection. And what kind of clouds are these? You know what kind okay. they are. Know, lenticular, lenticular clouds, brother. That's a gorgeous shot there, too. Makes you want to travel to all these places. Look at that. Ugh. 
drives me crazy yeah. seeing shots like this. Cool. All right. Thanks, Scott. Um, yep. So the Jim Scott. Shoemaker. Jarvanator. Go. Okay. Here we go. So uh, since this was just last moment here, I thought I'd jump in and find someone that I have been closely following because he's a good friend of mine. His name is Robbie Peterson. I know there's a couple people out on Google Plus that met him uh, when they came to a photo walk in Utah. He had a big beard. He doesn't at the moment. But um, I know him because I did his wedding uh, a while back. And, um, and I just kind of, he wasn't doing a lot of photography. And then all of a sudden, I checked out his Google Plus page. And I started to see some pretty amazing pictures. And it's just so cool. You know, when you see people uh, progress, uh, that's such a fun thing to do, to see their progression. I mean, he's not like amazing, amazing like every shot, but just he's starting to come up with some amazing things. It's just really cool to see my friends achieving their goals of being a really good photographer. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, Peter. Let me screen share. So, um, my um, uh, my pick is Doug Saunders. Um, he's a, a commercial um, uh, photographer out of the DC area, um, and not hugely followed here on Google Plus. But he's got a big Twitter following, and I think he's got a Kelby training video that's coming out. But he does these really cool photos of like um, stri you know like um, fantastical cars and scenes. Um, he's got a bunch of um, bunch of really cool portrait work um, and shots of really sort of exotic cars. Um, he's got the Ghostbusters. Um, he, he does a lot of shoots with with famous cars from movies like the A Team van and the Ghostbusters ambulance and um, lots of um, portraits, personal work that he's done, putting Star Wars figures, recreating sort of scenes from that. Um, just really some in really interesting stuff, um, including pet photography, <laughs> um, some pet portraits, which is really fun work. Uh, he shoots with a phase one too. Um, I there's not a lot of folks um, are putting out a lot of work there on Google Plus with phase one, so I try to follow everybody that does. Um, and I just really like a lot of his um, a lot of his work. And if you're into behind the scenes stuff and for commercial photography, um, he does a lot of uh, behind the scenes work. So. Um, you can learn a lot from what he's doing. Cool, cool. Good stuff. All right. Do you have one, John P. By chance? I do indeed have one. Uh, it is one of my favorites. Let me see if I can uh, pull this up here. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Matt Adcock. Um, he actually lives and works down in Playa del Carmen, Mexico, and he does uh, mostly, well, I don't know if he does mostly, but a lot of wedding photography, and uh, specifically underwater type wedding photography. Uh, let me see if I can get... With, with his wife. With his wife? Yeah. Very cool. So these shots, they're just, I mean, amazing. I find, I find all of his photos to be incredible, uh, just on a technical level and a creative level. Uh, I, I don't know how he gets things so sharp and yet, you know, so uh, well laid out as, as well. Let's see if we can find one or two of these. Things like this. It's beautiful. I mean, I have no idea how you do that or how you get all the colors or how much uh, post work is in this, but check him out, Matt, Matt Adcock. 
fantastic photographer. And a cool guy. Very cool. Awesome. Good one. All right, next, Eric. All right, um, here we go. So this is a uh, Phil Cola's work. He's active on Google Plus, and um, I know him as an underwater photographer. Um, and I first came across his work because he's extremely prolific and on the California coast. So he's got a, a ton of really, really great California nature photography. Um, you know, everything from uh, dolphins and waves to kind of landscapes and night stuff. So he's he's extremely versatile. Um, He's got some great shots of blue whales, which is, you know, that's pretty rare to get, especially because visibility where they're feeding is usually very poor. Um, but he's super versatile. I mean, if you look at his albums here, uh, he's got, a, in, a, in addition to California nature stuff, he has birds travel, astrophotography, aerial photography. Um, yeah, and super thoughtful uh, photographer and always out shooting. Uh, so I highly recommend checking his work out, Phil Cola, C-O-L-L-A. Awesome, oh. thanks. We'll get these guys all plus mentioned in the show notes, and um, I'll reshare them. I know we just got the show notes done for last week's show. I haven't shared that, but I will um, shortly, probably uh, tomorrow morning. I won't do it this late because it's too late, and uh, most people won't see it, but I'll, I'll do it in the, when I wake up tomorrow, which I guess is about five hours later in the middle of the U.S., so. We'll get that shared. All right, Dave, um, anything else before we wrap up the show? No, sir. Nothing else? Nothing. Any parting words, John P.? Any great, anything great you want to talk about? Uh, you know, going back to the, the theme of today's show, which was all about backup and stuff, there was one little tip that I forgot to mention when we were talking about final tips there. Um, do not rely on any devices that are over maybe four or five years old. I mean, once once your storage is three years old, and I'm not just talking about your hard drives, I'm talking about the physical boxes they're in, everything, um, I would say that three to four years into it, you're putting your stuff at risk. Just plan on refreshing your, your hardware, you know, after that period of time just to eliminate more risk. It's all about controlling the risk. Yeah, I think that's a good way to say it. It's a little way you kind of say it's like exercise or diet, uh, both of which I know you don't do, John P., so maybe this is bad. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, when you choose to make like exercise and diet part of your life, it has to just become part of your lifestyle. And that's the thing with backup is you can't think, okay, I'm going to go up to Best Buy and get a couple things and I'll be done. It's really sort of a lifestyle choice. You have to be ready to get new drives all the time and, and always be copying and be thinking about it all the time. It is It will take up mind space and it will take up time and money, but you do kind of have to make buy, back up part of your life. You agree with that, John P., even though you don't agree with my, my stance on diet and exercise. Indeed. Indeed I do. John P. is like the only man I know in the world that like eats zero. I mean, this is actually a policy of his. Actually, he, yeah. he goes. He's so bold as to make it a policy not to eat anything green or even like resembling a vegetable. Is that right? I, well, I do eat corn. <laughs> yeah, I, I like <laughs> corn too. Yeah. And I eat mushrooms. I love mushrooms. I like mushrooms and, and corn too, but no other vegetables. Yeah, I. You know what? I'm still the, probably the healthiest guy you know. I mean, so hey, what the you hell? are not healthy. I don't know. I wouldn't call you the healthiest guy I know. Really? I know Eric Chang. That guy's always diving off dive boats and European speedos, and he looks like a million bucks. <laughs> yeah, right. He's pretty healthy. He's, pretty healthy. <laughs> he's not forty. Uh, he's. You're not in your forties yet, are you, Eric? Uh, actually, no one can tell how old I am. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I'm not. Yeah. Come, come see me when you're in your 40s, and we'll, we'll compare notes. All right, we'll do. <laughs> we'll see you in 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> All right, John P., we're going we're gonna to arm wrestle next time we get together. Let's do it, baby. Come on, bring it. And we'll, we'll He's record been it. women. Yeah, yeah, I get a lot. Hey, yeah, I get a lot of exercise picking up hot chicks. <laughs> your humility uh -oh. doesn't exercise, though. Okay. We're going we're gonna to cut the show now. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and uh, we'll see you uh, next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you. Bye. See you guys. Thanks, Scott and Scott and Peter.
Sure. Eric, sure. Dave. Thank you. See you guys next time. Oh. Bye.